Thanks very much, Califax, again. And we walk to the tail end of the dinosaur, um, where with me, Sander van Deventer, originally an internist, gastroenterologist. Some people in the traditional hospital were, would say you lost your way, and when gastroenterologists lose their way, you end up in funny places, that's uh, for sure. Um, because you're now a venture capitalist at Forbion, but you founded Biotechs, among others, Unicure, one of the Dutch gene therapy companies. You've, you're still a colleague in Leiden, as a professor of gastroenterology. And you're one of the first people to have administered TNF to people with Crohn's disease, with enormous effects, of course, on the disease. So no better place uh, to a person to talk to us about how venture capital feeds the new life forms. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Adam. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here. Um, maybe you're wondering why Jean-Jacques is on the front part and me on the back. Uh, uh, I, I have no answer to that question, but being a gastroenterologist, that's sort of the default where you, <laughs> where you, where you end, okay? So uh, yeah, we have 30 years of uh, CIHDR and then 30 plus years for Adam. And so I, I, I thought I'd, br uh, I'd bring you back 30 years, so 1987, uh, and this is a slide to bring you a little bit in the mood. Uh, you, you will recognize the leaders uh, from those days. Uh, we didn't like them very much, or at least I didn't like them, but compared to what you have now, uh, you know, it's not so bad actually. Uh, and, uh, and then you see the artists there and you will recognize all of them. Maybe you wonder what Amy Winehouse does there, uh, but actually she was born eh, in 1987. Now, um, I was, uh, I was, I had just started as an internist in 1987, and um, so if I take you back to how, how clinical practice was then, uh, actually it was, it was not that good, eh? so, um, you know, we had patients with rheumatoid arthritis, and they, you know, routinely ended up in wheelchairs being young ladies, uh, and, uh, and just being cared for, and Crohn's disease, well, more than 90% of all patients with Crohn's disease had to undergo surgery, and uh, more than 20, 25% of patients with Crohn's disease ended with a stoma, as you can see there. Well, if you had AIDS, it was very simple, you would just die. Uh, and then for hemophilia, uh, many hemophiliacs uh, have, you know, recurrent joint bleeds despite treatment, and that's a very dis 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 uh, disabling condition as well. So, it wasn't that good. Now, uh, we all need, of course, uh, some role model, and the reason actually I started studying medicine is, is, is because I was reading these books from Lewis Thomas, and if you don't know who Lu Lewis Thomas is, you, you better buy some books. Uh, and one of the books is The Youngest Science, of course, he's more known for the lives of a cell. But The Youngest Science is an autobiography of more or less of Lewis Thomas. And so he's describing here in his autobiography how things were when there, were no, when there was no penicillin and when you had pneumonia. And so most patients with pneumonia caused by pneumococcus would die. But uh, basically the, what they would do, and this was something that was also worked on by Maxwell Finland and people like that in Boston. And basically what they would do is, is basically they would culture the pneumococcus themselves. The doctor would do that. And then, uh, and then they would immunize a, a rabbit. And then they would, after some days, uh, uh, harvest the uh, rabbit serum and they would uh, incubate the serum with the pneumococcus, and if there was something which they called a quellum reaction, then they would use that serum to treat the patients. Now, of course, nobody knows whether that worked. Uh, many patients died, of course, in, be in between the seven days that you needed to, to make this drug, uh, and of course, some patients died because of serum sickness because of the uh, rabbit serum. But anyway, that's what they did, and I, I really liked that because I thought as a doctor you would be able to do something for your patients and make medicines. Uh, soon after, of course, starting as a doctor, I realized that uh, it, it didn't work that way, but uh, I thought, you know, maybe we need to change something here. And so, by chance, actually, uh, I got involved in, uh, in working on bacterial endotoxins. Uh, and these are from gram-negative bacteria, pneumococci, gram-positive bacteria. And endotoxins are lipopolysaccharides, as you can see on the left panel, which are on the outer side of the outer membrane of, of uh, gram-negative bacteria. And uh, it was already long known since the 1890s, 1900s that they were toxic. That's why they're called endotoxins. But it was very hard to actually measure them. And it was very hard, and nobody really knew, uh, you know, what their role was in the sepsis process. 
So the only thing, actually, when I started working on this that you could do is uh, there's a crab. It's called the limbless crab. And uh, the crab has a, a lymph. And if you incubate endotoxins with the lymph of this crab, the, the lymph will coagulate. And if you have a coagulation reaction, then it uh, tells you that there's endotoxin there. So all the ladies that you see there, actually, they caught these crabs on the beach, uh, actually, in, uh, in, uh, in Boston, near Boston. And then they had these sort of stands, and they're puncturing uh, the heart of the crab. And then they are uh, harvesting this lymph, and, and that was how you would test endotoxin. So the work, early work I did, was to make this into a test that was much more sensitive and f and, and reliable, and and, and chromogenic, a chromogenic limbless assay, as it is called. Uh, and now we could test endotoxins in humans, and so that led to our first Lancet publication, where actually we showed that if you measure these endotoxins that it predicts if you have these endotoxins in your blood, you will become really ill, you'll become septic, and there's a hi much higher chance of dying if you have these in your blood. So that was an accomplishment, but uh, you know, having read uh, a lot of this Lewis Thomas uh, work and, and other work, I thought, you know, uh, well, okay, these endotoxins are in some way associated with sepsis, but what is it actually that kills patients uh, that, uh, that have these endotoxins in their blood? It, you know, is it the endotoxins in the cells, or, you know, what really happens? And so, you know, being a sort of, uh, you know, uh, do-it-yourself doctor, I thought, well, let's test it, and let's in in inject these endotoxins in our cells. And uh, the left panel that you see there is the actual uh, setup. It was not very fancy. It was actually a, a bed uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a little uh, corner of the hospital, where, uh, you know, we sort of started uh, experimenting on ourselves, uh, injecting endotoxins, and for sure, if you inject endotoxin in yourself, you become really ill. Uh, you know, your blood pressure drops and your neutrophils go down, you get thrombocytopenia, coagulation system is activated, your neutrophils go berserk, uh, and you can see all that. I mean, uh, here you can see the blood pressure, uh, the, the, uh, the, you see the fever and the neutropenia and everything happening. But at the same time, in the lab at Rockefeller University, uh, TNF was detected, so it was a cytokine was detected that if you injected this cytokine in, uh, in, in animals, actually, the very same thing would happen. And so by combining everything and working together with Rockefeller, and that is where I later would go, because because of this work I was recruited there, we found that it was actually only when you had the TNF in your, in your blood that you became ill. So the endotoxins are only there for 30 minutes, but they activate your host immune system to make these endogenous factors that make you very ill, including TNF. Now, being a gastroenterologist, I was really curious whether there would be TNF in other places, and so we, 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 we measured all kinds of things, and, and here you can see the mucosa, and there was a lot of TNF in the mucosa, and I thought, well, maybe if we have anti-TNF antibodies, it would be a good idea to test in Crohn's disease, and it worked like fantastic. And so most patients with Crohn's disease and actually also with rheumatoid arthritis are now being treated with anti-TNF antibodies and the first was, was Remicade. That only took six years. It only took six years from finding out that there was TNF until the discovery of something to do about it and it became one of the, you know, I think major drug for patients with, with these diseases. Oh, you want to make this picture? I'll, I'll pull it up back again. <laughs> You have it? <laughs> okay. Okay, so fast forward 30 years. Um, um, so, uh, yeah, I think there is, are many triumphs now of translational research. We have monoclonal antibodies against God knows what. We have leukocyte uh, adhesion blockers, actually. The, b the best drug you have for ulcerative colitis is a leukocyte adhesion blocker. We have kinase inhibitors. We have immune checkpoint inhibitors, which really change the prognosis for patients with certain cancers now. And we have CAR T cells, and then we have platforms like cyclic peptides and gene therapies. I'll talk a little bit about that. Gene silencing, CRISPRs, you name it, oncolytic viruses, etc. So we have accomplished a lot. We don't have these patients any longer in wheelchairs, etc. And, uh, and if you have HIV, you have a normal lifespan. So drugs have changed the lives of patients enormously. So much better therapies. For example, if you have Crohn's disease, and if you use an anti-TNF, now you can cure the lesions in the gut. 
So the left upper panel, Crohn's, if you give an anti-TNF, you get mucosal healing. We did not have mucosal healing until we had these anti-TNF antibodies. And the prognosis of a patient that has mucosal healing is fantastically better than a patient that doesn't have that. So if you use your old-fashioned medicines, that's why you get all these surgery and recurrences and all that, because you don't heal the disease really. But these um, uh, compounds now really t attack, uh, attack the disease and, and, and cure it. Another example, you know, gene therapy is something I'm working on quite actively in the company Unicure. And this is an example, maybe you think gene therapy is something from the future, but it's really now. This is a five-year follow-up of patients with, uh, that we treated only once with a vector that brings the gene for factor 9, the coagulation factor 9, into the liver. And these are patients with hemophilia and they lack a normal factor 9, that's why they bleed. So what we do is we simply replace the factor 9, put it in the liver, and this little virus AAV does it for us. One single treatment, no complications. It's just an outpatient procedure, okay? Nothing special. But these patients now start to make their own factor, factor 9, and they don't bleed any longer. That's what the right lower panel says. No more bleedings. And more importantly, no more bleedings, no more therapy. These are patients are completely off therapy, for five years, and they don't bleed. And, and, and we are improving these therapies, and I'm pretty sure that for diseases like hemophilia and other diseases, and uh, there's a whole list of them, that uh, within 10 years, uh, between now and 10 years, this is going to be the preferred therapy, of course. You treat patients once, you never see them back again. This can last, actually, in monkeys for at least 10 years and still is ongoing, so very long-lasting, you can say, cures. And then finally, if you, if, you, if you think about cancer, only in the last 15 years or so, the prognosis of cancer patients or some cancer patients has dramatically improved, and a lot of this is because of medicines. And then, of course, there are some cancers where we still have enormous challenges, and I think those are the challenges we should tackle in, in the coming, coming years. Now, there is a misunderstanding that these new drugs, that they're very expensive, so the drugs for cancer and for anti-TNFs, and everybody's talking about that all the time in uh, very expensive drugs. Now, the, the real story, ladies and gentlemen, is that, the, that we pay 7% of our healthcare costs go to medicine. That was 20 years ago, and that's still now. It's the same. It hasn't increased. So despite our very expensive new medicines, we are not paying more overall for medicines. And that is because some medicines that were in the past very expensive are now dirt cheap. This is nicely depicted here. You see the, the, the green uh, uh, line there, that's our medicines. You can see some things really disproportionately have, has bec have become more expensive, like, you know, really expensive hospitals and all that. I, I would say if you have HIV or if I would have HIV, I'd rather have the medicine than the hospital, to be sure. If I would have hemophilia, I'd rather have a treatment once that would never put me in the hospital anymore than, than have a really nice hospital. So, you know, you can think about it. On the other hand, you really have to be aware of the fact that we think we're doing quite well, but, uh, you know, if you look at all the monogenetic diseases and other diseases, we only actually target, I think, m effectively 10% of all diseases. There are so many diseases that we do not effectively target with conventional and even with our new medicines. So where do those new medicines come from? That's a big, important question for society, for us all. You know, we, we all grow old and then we'll get disease and maybe you want to be cured, maybe not. But if you want to be cured, you, you need new drugs, yeah? Okay, large pharma is in trouble, and this is why. First of all, the costs of developing a new drug are roughly 1.5 billion, and that is sort of constant over the last five years or so. But the income out of blockbuster drugs is dramatically going down. So even in the last five years, there is a 40% reduction uh, if you look at the return from a blockbuster drug for large pharma. So the income side is really heavily hurt. Now, the, if you look at the return on the investment in new drugs every year, and the estimates for that, that is really sharply declining. So from 10% return in 20, 2010, which is sort of healthy and, and, but, and necessary, 
it is now uh, below 4%. If you look at the cost of capital, so the cost to finance research, it's probably not at least 9 to 10%. And so it doesn't make sense for pharma any longer to develop new drugs because it's counter uh, productive. You, m you won't make money with that. And it's a big concern to me and it should be a big concern to all of you. And the other point is, if you look at pharma and the timelines for developing a new drug, there are about roughly 12 years, for all other industries, like even the aircraft industry, it's only six years. And, 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 and if, you look at, uh, if you look at the investments being made in, 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 in for R&D over, over uh, the total earnings in pharma, it's almost 15%. It's much lower for any other sector. So the risk, so to say, that you take in investing in new drugs is exceedingly high. And so even the 10% cost of capital is probably too low. This is a big issue. The other issue is that so many drugs fail during development. This is the large pharma pipeline in my depiction here. And if you look at the end, what comes out, very few drugs every year, very few drugs. You want the numbers, here they are. This is the FDA. Last year, only 22 drugs were approved. And if you look at them, there's only about seven or eight maybe, if, if, I'm, if I, I'm really, you know, if I'm really uh, not very strict, maybe seven drugs for new diseases. Now, if you, if you, you know, it, it will take hundreds of years to make drugs for all diseases if, we, if you continue in this way. At the same time, here in all over the world, but uh, as we are in the Netherlands, I will, you know, focus on the Netherlands, there is uh, a war against drugs, but it's the war against expensive therapeutic drugs. So this is our minister here, our healthcare minister. It says a wide front against expensive cancer medicines. And it says pharmaceutical industry be prepared. So that's basically the sort of talk, okay? Now, if you want to have new drugs, you will have to have the willingness to pay for them. And the reason is it takes a lot of expense and a lot of time to make a new drug. $1.5 billion for, for a new drug. Those very expensive drugs, and you have to think about uh, drugs for antiretroviral drugs or uh, uh, you know, statins or uh, all kinds of other drugs. They were expensive in the, in the beginning. Now they're dirt cheap. A statin costs about two dollars or two euros per month now. So you have to do the investment in order to get really affordable medicines. If you don't do the investment, you won't have medicines at all. I mean, that's an important one. And, you know, you, maybe you think, you know, let him talk, but I'll show you the data. So you have a decline in the return on investment for new drugs, as you can see here. I mean, these are, uh, I can show you the data. These are well-researched data. The IRR on the R&D is going sharply uh, down the drain. At the same time, the R&D investments, because of this, because the shareholders now tell the large pharma companies, don't do that any longer. You're not making money with that. The R&D investments are going down. Hundreds of thousands of uh, researchers in large pharma have been sacked. You have to think of OS. OS is nothing in the Netherlands. It's been all over the world. Uh, hundreds of thousands of researchers have been dismissed. Now, at the same time, look at the antibiotics. Some time ago, there were 18 pharmaceutical companies developing antibiotics. Now it's two, and there are no new antibiotics for uh, antimicrobial resistance. At the same time, uh, the resistant bugs are going up, as you can see here, MRSA, VRE, you name it. It will take, if we start now, it will take 10 years and it will take billions of investment to get those new drugs around, and d those new, new, new drug, drugs available. This is a big issue. If we continue like this, it's going to be a problem. Okay, so how, what do we do? Now, the governments have a little bit of a misperception about translational research. And Jean-Jacques already addressed some of the issues there. They think if you give a researcher some subsidy and a little money, then a drug sooner or later will come out of it. Now, that necessarily is not the case. Uh, but, uh, for example, our same minister, uh, you know, boasted that she's going to solve uh, the um, antibiotic, antibiotic resistance by investing six million in for, uh, industry or in uh, research in, uh, in academic institutes. Well, I mean, look at this. This is the reality. If, 
if you start a pharmaceutical company, and this is what I do for a life now, and my fund has done more than 60 of them, it will cost you easily 100 million to get somewhere. You know, six million is absolutely nothing. The other thing is that the knowledge to develop drugs is not in um, academic institutes. It's with CHDR and it's with large pharma, but it's not in academia. So you cannot do this in academia. You need to have the expertise and you need to have the money and the right people to do this. So where do they come from? If you look at our current portfolio of large pharma uh, pharmaceutical companies, and you know, very common drugs you see here, already 30 to 40% actually was bought. So you, sometimes you, you hear J&J &J boast about Umira, but actually that was bought, or, or Remicade that was bought, Umira was bought, all these drugs have, had been bought. Now this is going to be 80% or more. I'm not saying this, this is what the CEOs of large pharma companies are saying. So these drugs all will be developed by medium-sized or small biotech pharmas. The, the one Jean-Jacques was just talking about, those companies. And these companies, all of them are venture capital financed by venture capital. And if you look at the breakthrough technologies, the monoclonal antibodies, gene therapy, gene silencing, stuff like that, cancer immunotherapy, it all came from outside pharmaceutical companies, usually from these small uh, companies. So the new drugs are being developed by venture capital-backed, small, medium-sized companies. Those are the 100 companies here in the Leiden Bio, Bio, uh, Bioscience Park. That sort of company, company is now developing our new drugs. So do we need to make war uh, you know, against the pharmaceutical industry? I would say probably not. So it's actually more than 30 years ago, this. So how do we go about it? And these are my last slides. First of all, this is from the last issue of uh, the New England Journal of Medicine, but it actually is completely what we are doing in our biotech companies as we speak. The patient is the center. When we were developing hemophilia therapies or therapies for you know, very severe diseases like San Filippo, we first speak to the patients. I know each and every patient that we have treated in this trial so the patient is the center. We ask them, what do we do, et cetera, et cetera, and then we put something around it. We also very closely work with academia on this. We always make these partnerships. And I think in the Netherlands, it is to be hoped that the government and the regulatory institutes become more involved in this. The small biotechs and the patients and the doctors, the key opinion leaders, they are all in the same camp. It's the governments and the regulatory authorities that we need to put also in the same camp. Um, and also, another thing is the virtual pharmaceutical company. We um, actually sold a pharmaceutical company to Amgen um, um, uh, two years ago for $1.3 billion. They're making a new drug for uh, dyslipidemia, and that drug actually was sold to Amgen. And when we sold the company, uh, the company had actually very few employees. Actually, um, I'm not allowed by Amgen to tell you how many, but uh, I can tell you it was not more than two, actually. <laughs> I won't tell you the exact number. So how, how does this work? So what we do now is basically, if you start a company, you start with a problem. So this is one problem. We have statins and they work very nice. But if you, if you optimally treat patients after a coronary event with statins, then there still is a pretty high risk that you see this patient back in the hospital with an, another coronary event sooner rather than later. So there's a residual risk. And one of the things that comes out is that part of that residual risk and large part of the residual risk has to do something with triglycerides. So we were thinking, can we do something about this residual risk and how would we do it? And so, the lipids in your blood actually are not circulating as, as uh, you know, as, as, as free uh, 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 molecules, but they are contained in, in these lipoprotein particles. And looking at it, we came, you know, uh, to a conclusion that we had to uh, address these very atrogenic lip lipid particles, lipoproteins, which are called remnant particles. If you look at everything that statins do and all that, it's basically uh, altering the composition of the particles, particularly the cholesterol 
composition, of course, of these particles. The same goes for new drugs like uh, PCSK9 inhibitors and uh, CTP inhibitors. So one of the approach we are taking is basically, can we address these lipoprotein particles directly with an antibody that targets a something that is in these remnants, and we chose to do this with an APOC3 targeting antibody. Very difficult to do, actually. There were patents on this issued by large pharmaceutical companies, and they abandoned them because they couldn't do it. Very hard to do. So how do you do this? And one of the things we assembled here is a, a knowledge base. So we came together with people like uh, Paul Da Silva, who had been in, uh, working on this with Pfi on, at Pfizer for 24 years. And he was working in the Pfizer labs in New Haven. Pfizer was uh, abandoning labs. We said, fine, we'll take it from you. And we'll take Paul with it. So Paul stayed where he was. And we just took over the whole thing. And so we had a good lab there. And then we had excellent people like Alan Toll at Columbia University and, uh, and uh, Dan Rader at Pennsylvania. And, uh, and, and we called the company Staten Biotechnology because we also were on the other side of the ocean and we were thinking about, you know, what links the Netherlands with uh, New York. And uh, that was Staten Island, of course, and that's why it's Staten Biotechnology. Uh, we had a serial entrepreneur, Daniela Kuto, also good to have a woman there who is not uh, like 60 years old like me or more, actually. And then John Kastelein and myself. And so we brought this all together, and we could not have done it if we wouldn't have borrowed some really advanced technology from another of our portfolio company, Argenix, who has the antibody technology and a strategic partnership with a company in Switzerland, Lonza, who is making these antibodies for us. So this company also has only two employees, uh, and uh, it actually, within two years of time, has made a drug that now works. We have this working preclinically, and this is going to be an, another Decima, I think, and another of the a series of uh, uh, virtual pharma companies that we make. My conclusions. First of all, I mean, we have to realize that these new drugs that we're complaining about because they're so expensive, and we are not paying more for our drugs, but new drugs are expensive, but they will become cheap. These drugs have enormously altered the quality of life of patients. It is uncomparable when I was uh, starting as an internist with the situation now. There's no comparison. It's very much better for patients, and that is because of drugs. We can easily pay for expensive new drugs. There's no problem whatsoever. We don't have a problem there. It's not driving healthcare costs. I don't know why people are saying it, because if you look at the numbers, they're just plain wrong. They're not. And we have to pay for drugs in order to stay, sustain innovation. You have to be prepared to pay a lot of money for a new drug. It will become cheap later. Now, the large pharma R&D is under pressure, and already now most of these drugs are made by small biotech companies, like here in this bioscience park, and with the help of CHDR. And that is why this infrastructure here is so important. This is where the drugs are being made, not at the large pharmaceutical companies. And then finally, you know, we really must alter the paradigms, and this is a little intro in, into your next speaker. We must alter the paradigms that have led to these enormous long drug development timelines, timelines and the exceedingly high costs that are associated with drug development. And that's it. Thank you very much.